Oxbow turtles are listed as critically endangered from the IUCN Red List. Globally, the, one of the major threats are direct uh, capture for meat consumption and egg collection. Here you could say that um, threats could be, the, for the, to begin with, climate change uh, that can affect the coral reef areas mm -hmm. and then obviously directly affects their, the feeding habitats of the turtles. Mm -hmm. For the turtle to become adult, it takes like about 25 to 30 years. So a little hatchling that comes out, you know, this, uh, this year, for example, it will only come back to nest 30 years after. So imagine the, the extent of the change that can happen on the coastline can have a significant effect. The Marine Turtle Conservation Project uh, started in 2010 as a project of Emirates Wildlife Society, WWF. It's a regional project, so it's throughout the UAE, Oman, Qatar, and Iran. There's just not been a lot of research coming from the Middle Eastern area to be able to identify it, especially on a scale this large with 75 turtles, four countries. Mm -hmm. And the goals were really to identify where these key areas are for turtle conservation mm -hmm. and identifying the migration patterns and foraging grounds of female hawksbills that we've been tagging through satellite tracking. We know that hawksbill turtles, uh, the nesting season is around spring, so mm -hmm. the peak will be end of April and uh, during the month of May. Researchers through genetic analysis, they've seen that, uh, that the turtles have a tendency to come back where they uh, actually born and then come back every two or three years. So we work with our partners to identify key nesting areas. Together with them, we plan our field work and we get the necessary permits. Most of the areas we visit are offshore islands and uh, turtles nest during the night. So mm -hmm. we kind of organize ourselves and patrol the areas during the night time. Uh, limited noise and limited light from our side, not to scare the turtles. So as soon as we find one turtle with nesting, we hide close to her and uh, we wait until she finishes laying her eggs. And after she digs then her nest and on her way back to the sea, we kind of capture her and we deploy the transmitter there. The process is basically we clean her carapace from any barnacles or seaweed um, and then we deploy the transmitter which is the size of a, of a mobile phone and we deploy three layers of fiberglass with resin so we make mm -hmm. sure that the transmitter stays on her shell as much as possible and we wait until it's dry so it's a very long process especially if there's a, a humid night it takes a long time for the resin to dry so we make sure that it's completely dry and then after that we release the turtle back to the water. The transmitter has like a salt water switch, so there are like two metal uh, ends. Obviously, like during the few minutes that the turtle surfaces to, to breathe, then the transmitter turns on, so we save battery, and immediately send more than one signal to the satellite. So then you're able to georeference this location. MBZ Species Conservation Fund was able to benefit the project um, in a couple of different ways actually. Uh, the funding that we received, uh, one provided two satellite transmitters, so for two different um, turtles we were able to track them, not just pay for the satellite transmitter itself, but also the tracking and the satellite um, use that we had throughout the duration of that tracking, which we're actually still benefiting from. Um, also. Another contribution that was made was for the communications aspect of the project, which is extremely important because one of the objectives of this project is to raise the awareness of the community um, in this region. And so one of the ways that we did that was through what we call the Great Gulf Turtle Race. And um, it was a way for the public to be able to get involved in a very fun and lighthearted way to um, either track all the turtles or track their favorite turtles. The sponsors were also extremely involved. So we saw a lot of visitors to the website during that time. I think it was um, over 120,000 unique visitors to our website, um, gaining information about the Hawksbill turtles and marine turtles in general, why they're important, why it's critical for us to conserve that the habitat. So it was really nice to be able to 
kind of extend this research beyond the scientific community and beyond the partners and really be able to reach a much wider um, network and community. The website is just, it's a tool, it's a platform that exists like throughout the duration of the project as well. So when that main kind of um, campaign, when we had the turtle race, when that finishes, that website stays there. You can't save something that you don't know about, um, and especially if you haven't been informed or taught or educated about how to do that. And um, a lot of the people in this region might not go out into nature, so they might not see these animals firsthand. For them to start to understand about how their daily life might impact creatures at sea, whether it's through um, pollution, it could be through oil spills, but it could be also through like plastic bags or trash floating. Um, like the, the hawksbill turtles feed off jellyfish, mm -hmm. and plastic bags often look like jellyfish, so um, they ingest them, and then sometimes they suffocate or um, like maldigestion. What do you do if you see a turtle during nesting season? And it's important that they understand that they need to leave her. Um, it's also important to understand that if you're in a, a beach community where there might be turtles nesting, that the lighting is important. So there are a number of different messages that um, people received through this race and through the, the communication aspect of this project. There's not just one threat, and they're all important no matter which threat it is, if it, if it takes one marine turtle's life, especially when that turtle is critically endangered, then it's a significant loss.